thank you everyone for joining us tonight on our, I think it's our seventh webinar from the East Sussex I group. Um, as usual, uh, we will be recording this uh, webinar and it will be on the um, ESEC YouTube channel. If you haven't checked it out yet, please do because our previous webinars are on there. Um, and um, so there's one CET point available tonight for optometrists and dispensing opticians. That's if you're watching it live from the link. Um, it does record the time and uh, who's uh, registered and I will upload the CET hopefully this weekend. Um, the lecture will run for approximately 40 to 45 minutes with about 15 to 20 minutes uh, at the end for questions. So at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A box. So if you have any questions, please type your questions in there throughout the webinar. And what we'll do is at the end of uh, Sarah's uh, lecture, I will then read the questions out to Sarah. And we'll try and get through all of them, or at least as many as we can in the time allowed, because um, quite often there's lots of questions. So um, I'm just reading this bit out. So I'd like to welcome tonight's speaker, Sarah Bradbury. Sarah is an orthoptist at East Sussex Healthcare Trust and has worked there for over 20 years. She works in the orthoptics clinic and she is a non-medical injector for MD patients. She is also the orthoptic stroke lead and works in the low vision clinic. She trained at Sheffield University and helped train new orthoptists on placements at the East Sussex Healthcare Trust. So tonight, Sarah will present to us a webinar on paediatric strabismus and the role of the optometrist. So thank you very much, Sarah. I'd like to hand over to you so you can share your screen now. Oh. No swearing. Is that okay? Mm, I can't see your screen yet, no. Why not? Hang on, try again. It worked 20 minutes ago. Yeah? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, shoot. Okay. Um, well, thank you, everybody, and apologies for any technical hiccups or me forgetting my words because I'm a little bit nervous about doing this and it all feels really strange to do it to a screen and not to actual people not from saying you're not actual people but you know what I mean um so when Ian asked me to do this um I had a bit of a struggle as to what to do because it's a rather big subject just saying orthoptics hang on so, Sarah can you hear me yeah somebody's just said they can't see um how can you see the corner of the screen I'm just going to see if it's, uh, I can see your full screen. Can you, can you see the screen, Sarah's screen now? I can see Sarah's screen. Yes, somebody's put yeah. yes. I can see all, yes. So people can see the screen. So um, I think carry on. Okay. Um, I've totally forgotten where we're going now. Oh yes. Um, so when Ian asked me to do this, I wasn't sure where to start. So I had a look on the College of Optometry website at what they suggested should be done when examining younger children. And they had a nice little list of what tests should be carried out. So I thought that was a, a good place to start. Um, so obviously the first thing to think about is visual acuity. And I appreciate I'm talking to optometrists, so you all know what that is. Um, but it is the ability to see detail of an object. And it's generally measured in Snellen or Logmar value. So the original Snellen um, visions corresponded to being able to stimulate two cones and pick out the detail in what you were seeing. Um, but nowadays, most of us use the Logmar charts um, because they're much more accurate on the testing. And they are comparable and there is a uh, chart for what vision, what Snellen visions and Logmar visions are. Um, at the hospital, we use Logmar visions, but I know that often people want to swap them back into Snellen's because that's what we all know and are used to. Um, so this has always been quite a useful chart and we actually have it up on the walls at work so that we can compare back when we need to. Um, so thinking about children's testing, obviously we want to do quantitative tests because we want to be able to 
um, record visions and compare the vision between either I and on um, following visits when they come in. So with the younger children, we tend to look at uh, preferential looking cards and card of acuity cards. So these preferential looking cards were the ones that were around when I first started training 20 something years ago. Um, and with them, the lines get closer together as the vision being tested gets more difficult. The problem with these was the child tended to be much more interested in looking at who was behind the card than actually looking at um, the, the stripes on the card. And the theory is they will look where there is something to look at. We tend to use Cardiff cards a lot, um, which are very good. They come, each uh, size comes with three different cards with one picture at the top, one picture at the bottom, and then a third one, either top or bottom. And we look at whether the child is looking up or down at the picture. Um, as the pictures get more difficult to see, the lines get very, get closer together and fainter. So it can be quite difficult towards the six, six level to be able to see those. Um, but it's also useful because you get to know when a child is able to tell you that there is a fish or a train on those pictures. The problem with the Cardiff cards is they're very good um, for comparing eyes. They're very good for watching visions as they develop. But we do know that a child that gets 6-6 six, six on a Cardiff cards will often not do quite so well when we start on a distance vision test as they get a little bit older. So the next thing, next test that we would try would be a K's pictures. And I've put crowded or singles, but actually we tend to use crowded because it gives a much more accurate vision. And we tend to use the K picture book. Um, and we've also got a reduced K's. And with these, you've got four pictures apart from, um, from one and 0 0.9. There's only two pictures on each. Um, and there's a box around the outside to give the crowding effect, which gives a much more accurate vision as well. Some of the pictures aren't great. Um, for instance, we'll often get roller boot instead of truck for the, for the pictures. But as long as the kids are quite consistent in what they call it, that's absolutely fine. Um, then we go up to a Logmar Crowded Letters book. So in most of our hospital rooms, fourth optics now, we have computerized testing um, charts, but the, these are the Logmar books that we started out with originally. There was, there's two of them. So um, the idea is you can use one book for one eye and one book for the other eye, just in case they've got a really good memory. Um, and there's only six letters on, the chart, on, on these charts which is good, um, but it does mean that they do have a one in six chance of getting it right. Um, but they do have letters that are quite similar. So there's a V and a Y, which you have to pick out the detail for. There's a U and an H. Again, they can be quite difficult to pick out when children's vision gets slower. Um, after that, we're back up to normal vision tests. So a Snellen and a Logmar chart. And when you look at them together, you can see why the Snellen chart isn't overly accurate when you're looking at comparing visions. So if you go from, say, the 660, the top line A to OE, that's 660 to 636, but one line's difference. All the lines have different numbers of letters on, um, and the crowding effect with, different, with each line as you go down the chart is much more. Whereas when you use a Logmar chart, um, you've got five letters on each line, the distance between the letters, both horizontally and vertically, is the same as you go down the chart, which gives you a much more accurate um, vision. And the difference between the top two lines and the bottom two lines is the same, whereas the difference between the top two lines and the bottom two lines on a Snellen chart is 660 to 636 and, say, 69 to 66. The next thing to think about is the cover test. So this is what we use to um, look for any manifest or latent squints. Um, important to start off with a torch so you can look at corneal reflections. Um, and just from that, you can quite often see, um, get an idea of what you're looking for with a child, especially if they're not great at fixing for a cover test. 
It's also really useful when you've got a child who looks like they're squinting. A lot of younger children will look like they've got a convergent squint because of their epicanthic folds, but actually you don't see anything on cover test. And when you look at the corneal reflections, like in this child, you can see that actually they're spot on in the center, even though he looks like he's got a right convergent squint. So corneal reflections are a good way to start. Then you want to do a cover uncover test. And when you do this, when you cover over the fixing eye, you then see the other eye move to take up fixation. So if they've got an esotropia, the eye starts in, moves out to take up fixation. Exotropia, the eye is out, but then will move in to take up fixation. So your heterotropias can be horizontal, vertical, torsional, or a mixture of the above. They can also be thought of as three types, so primary, secondary, which means that they've been caused by something else, or consecutive, which is when they've had surgery, say, for an esotropia, and uh, they become exotropic, exotropic after surgery. And this can often be later on in life as the eyes and the muscles all settle down. I'm only going to really talk about primary um, heterotropias. Um, so with esotropias, so an eye, one eye is drifting inwards, you can have a constant squint, which is present at all distances with and without their glasses. But some of them will have an accommodative element. So when they look at a light veneer, it stays the same as the distance. But when they look at a target, you see the angle increase. Or a non-accommodative, the angle doesn't increase when they're accommodating. Inter intermittent squints for esotropias, you have can be um, thought of as the accommodative types. So a fully accommodative esotropia is a child who squints without their glasses, but when they're in their full hypermetropic prescription, they are binocular. So they have a perfectly normal binocular set of eyes with their glasses on. In a convergent success esotropia, um, they are well controlled with their glasses, but when they look at something and accommodate veneer, um, at that point you see the angle increase. And these children will have a high ACA ratio, which is normally greater than five, five to one. So the ACA ratio, and apologies about the spelling there, um, is the ratio of accommodative convergence that is induced by each diopter of accommodation. So for every diopter of accommodation, yeah. they do so many units of convergence. This is a fixed relationship. So it doesn't change from birth up to presbyopia. Um, a normal range is about three to five. So anything over five is considered high. And this can be modified by surgery or by lenses. So these children, we will give them a bifocal segment so that when they're looking at things for close to, they've got that extra help um, and they don't have to accommodate as much so they don't converge as much. Now, when we start bifocal treatment, it's not a quick process. So the first bifocal we give them will normally be a plus three or a plus 350. Um, and they'll be in that pair of glasses for a year. And then we will look, as long as they are well controlled, to reduce the bifocal by about an 050 every six months until we get them preferably out of the bifocals. You can also have esotropias that are relating to distance, intermittent esotropias that are relating to distance, i.e. they will squint for near, but not in the distance or squint in the distance but not for near, which is rarer. Um, you can also get cyclic esotropias, but I have to say, I'm not sure I've ever really seen one. Um, and then there's that wonderful category of non-specifics for the children that don't really fit into any of the above categories. Exotropias can either be constant or intermittent again. And with the intermittents, they can be near exotropias or distance exotropias. But with the distance exotropias at, at the hospital, we think about whether they're true or simulated. So some children are a distance exotropia um, and for near they control it, but some are using their accommodation to control it. And that's what we call a simulated. Um, 
You can also have something called a microtropia. So a microtropia is a very small angle squint, normally less than 10 diopters, and they will have some form of BSV. Majority of them are ESOs, but you can get exomicrotropias. Um, and they say that uh, microtropias account for about 3% of the population. They'll often be an isometropic and the they will have reduced vision in the microtropic eye, which even with um, patching doesn't come up to the same level as the vision in the good eye. It's often a line or so further back and they'll often have reduced stereopsis so they won't get up to a normal level. And this is because of the way the eyes work. So when you think about normal retinal correspondence, um, you got a point in each eye that corresponds to each other when you're looking at an object. And in normal retinal correspondence, the fovea of one eye will correspond with the fovea of the opposite eye. When you've got abnormal retinal correspondence, the patient is using a point that isn't the fovea to fix, um, but they're using it as the fovea, so that is their permanent fixing point. Um, and that point is called eccentric fixation. So eccentric fixation is the point that they're fixing on and it's a monocular thing, whereas abnormal retinal correspondence is how that corresponds to the other eye. So there's two types of microtropia. You can have microtropia with identity and with these children, the point of eccentric fixation is the same as their ARC. So when you do a cover test, you don't see any movement because they're still fixing with their eccentric fixation point. A microtropia without identity, you will see a movement on the cover test, even though it'll be slight. And that's because the eccentric fixation point isn't as far out as their abnormal retinal correspondence point. So they will then move slightly to take up fixation. The next thing we think about is ocular movements. Um, so when testing ocular movements, obviously use a torch um, and you're checking your um, positions of gaze at the sides for your muscles, plus up and down for A and V patterns. Um, and these can be quite important when wondering why people who look like they're controlled straight ahead are struggling because when they look down for reading and things, they might become more eso or exotropic. It's important to remember though, that where you test the eyes isn't actually the main actions of the muscles. So when you think about, especially the um, obliques, you check them in an adducted position, but actually their horizontal action is abduction. And this is because when you put them into that position, you're taking out um, at some actions of the muscles in order to be able to pick up one specific action and see if that is fully working or not. Um, next thing is, aside, is refraction. Um, and it's important to cyclorefract children, especially if you think there's an accommodative element. Now, I've been asked a few times, and this is something that's changed since I qualified years ago. Um, it used to be common for people to take off um, extra uh, power for the effect of the sight flow. But actually nowadays, they, people just take off their working distance. So if you've got a working distance of 50 centimetres, you take two diopters off your ret. However, we do reduce the prescription. Um, so for instance, if a child has got a very high prescription and it's their first pair of glasses, we'll often reduce the prescription down just to help them adapt to them. Um, and if you've got a child, for instance, who is a hypermetrope, but has actually got a large exophoria, you might reduce it slightly so that to, you, cause you don't want to interfere with the control of their phorias. If you do reduce the prescription, it's important to make sure that you only reduce the sphere and not the sill because you still need the, and I'm going to get this bit wrong, but the best vision sphere in the correct place at the back of the eyes. And it's also important to reduce both eyes equally. So even if you've got a child who's a plus nine in one eye and plus two in the other, you need to take however much you're going to take off both eyes so that they remain balanced with the prescription. Now, children, young children are hypermetropic anyway. So knowing what prescription is normal for their age and at what point you might consider that you need to um, 
prescribe it um, can be difficult. So um, this table is very useful just to give you an idea of what would be considered normal and at what point it would be considered abnormal. But obviously this has to be taken into account with the child in front of you. So if a child is struggling with their visions, then you might give the glasses before, according to the table, they would need them because no child's read the instruction booklet and everybody's a bit different. When a child is referred to the hospital, all of the letters are triaged and marked up for either a paediatric clinic or a shared care clinic. All the children who are referred in will see the orthoptist. They'll then be dilated and refracted by the hospital optometrist. The shared care clinics are where the orthoptist and the optometrist see the patients. Um, and so the optometrist will also check fundus and media. And if anything, any problems are found, we'll then book them a doctor's appointment. If the letters are marked up for the paediatric clinic, then they will see the orthoptist, the optometrist, and then go through to either our ophthalmic consultant or registrar, and they will check under some media and also discuss any medical or surgical treatment that is required. When we give glasses to children, we know that there is an adapt adaptation period. So it can take up to about 16 weeks for a child to totally settle into a pair of glasses, um, or if we give a large change in the prescription. And generally we will not start treating amblyopia or consider surgery until they've had this 16 week adaptation period. Now, obviously that can be a little bit different if we get a child in who's six and a half um, and because of the plastic period, with, we may need to start treating a bit earlier than that, but we would try and give them as much as, time as possible to settle into the glasses. And for this reason, it's really useful if you're referring a child in if you can cyclorefract them and give them the glasses before they come into the hospital because they can start that ad adaptation period because there's a, obviously there's a waiting time between referral and being seen by us. Um, uh, some optometrists have said that they're not sure if they've got the right prescription so didn't want know whether they should prescribe it or not. I tend to feel that if you're not sure, you can always reduce the prescription a little bit, but at least if they've started wearing the glasses, they're starting to adapt and their eyes are starting to get used to wearing glasses. Amblyopia um, is the reduction of best corrective visual acuity in one or both eyes. So people can be amblyopic in both eyes. And this is when we can't find a structural abnormality of the visual pathway to, that has caused it. Within the hospital, we will use two main forms of occlusion, patches and atropine. Uh, parents uh, were, are given the option as to which is better. Um, because of COVID, atropine occlusion had to stop because we have to see children every six weeks on atropine. And obviously that wasn't possible over um, the COVID period. Um, but if we do give atropine, we know that quite often if they've got a big difference in the visions, then actually the atropine will blur the vision in their good eye but they'll still see better with the blurred good eye than they do with the amblyopic eye. So um, sometimes it patches are better to begin with. But again, this is only started after a cyclorefraction and adaptation if glasses are given. Um, sorry if that was all a bit quick and rushed. Um, I've got a couple of case studies as well. Um, and I have to say thank you to Lorraine for this who is our uh, deputy head optom uh, optometrist, sorry, Lorraine, orthoptist. Um, so this is um, two case studies where one's a patient that I first saw, and one's a patient that Lorraine first saw. So the first child was referred to as originally when he was three. Um, there was a family history of his dad having glasses and a patch as a child, and the parents had seen um, a convergent squint. When he came in, um, he wouldn't let us occlude his eyes, but he had visions of 0.825 and a moderate esophoria of about 18 units with full ocular movements. He was refracted and found to be a plus six in either eye. So we gave these glasses for full-time wear and at his next visit, his visions were improving and his control with his glasses on was really good. Without his glasses, he was still squinting. 
Um, he still had full ocular movements and he had normal stereopsis with his glasses. So we diagnosed this as a fully acom esotropia. He was then seen um, over the next three or four years. He was found to be controlling his esotropia to a microtropia. So he still had a very small angle squint with his glasses on. Um, and because his right vision was still reduced, we patched to get that right vision back up. And we got him up to about a 0.250, uh, which is about 69.5. And when we stopped patches, he seemed nice and stable. And we said, right, if everything's okay, we can discharge you at the next visit. When he came back in on the day we were thinking of discharging, he was squinting through his glasses. Um, and so we booked him for refraction and found a little bit of an increase. So we gave him the new glasses. Um, and when he came back, he had a squint, a much bigger squint with his glasses on um, and bigger squint without his glasses. When I did the ocular movements on this visit, I found that he had a uh, restriction of his lateral rectus on the right eye, which hadn't been noted before by any of the orthoptists. Um, when I pointed it out to dad, he hadn't been aware of it previously either, but could see it when I showed it to him. Because this is unusual and children don't normally start getting restrictions of um, muscle movement, um, I booked him urgently into the paediatric clinic. When he came for his paediatric clinic a couple of weeks later, his parents started to notice he was turning his face to the right now, um, but he was didn't have any headaches, he was generally fit and healthy, um, but he now had a minus four restriction of his right lateral rectus. Um, they also said after some chatting that he, they'd noticed he started bed wetting and he was dragging his leg when he was walking, um, but his pupils and his fundus all looked perfectly normal. So an urgent MRI was arranged. And this is his MRI results. Um, and if you can see the, uh, this is where I point, you see, there's two on the both MRIs, you can see there's a large pale area in the middle. Um, and that was a tumour that had grown just there. And he had what is called a diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. The second child came in not that long after um, the first one. Uh, she was five. She had recently come back from visiting Bangladesh and her parents had noticed a left convergence squint after they got back to the UK. They went to the GP um, because she had a headache, uh, because she had a temperature and he gave her some antibiotics, but the squint became more pronounced and three weeks later she was referred in to us at the hospital. By the time she came to us, she had a marked face turn to the left, no headaches, no pain, no blurring of vision, generally fit and healthy child. Her visions were good and nice and equal. Um, with a head posture, she had a very slight esotropia, but when we put her head straight, she had a moderate left esotropia, and she was aware of double vision at this point, which is a sign that she was binocular previously. When ocular movements were done, she had a minus four restriction of her lateral rectus. Now, this was the first time we'd seen this child, um, but the fact that her visions were equal and the fact that she was getting diplopia when she was manifest was a sign that maybe this was something new. No lid changes were noted because obviously we were thinking whether or not this could be a Duane syndrome um, and her pupils and her fundus were normal. And again, she went off for an MRI and she also had a diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. So there's been a lot of medical advances with children's um, cancers. Um, for instance, acute uh, lymphoblastic leukaemia only had a 10% survival rate in the 60s, and it's nearly 90%, with an overall survival rate for, of 83%. But this particular tumour is different. It's very rare, um, and it has a very reduced uh, five-year survival rate. So when thinking of cancers, we think about how many people um, with that particular type of cancer survive a five-year period, less than 1% of, of children with this or people with this particular tumour 
uh, survive five years. It's a very rare aggressive tumour from the, which comes from the brainstem. And as I say, less than 40 in a year in the UK. So for us to get two, I think it was probably in the case of six to nine months, um, it's very unusual. Um, because of where it's located, it's right in the middle of the brain on the ponds. Um, it's very difficult to treat. Um, and it can start affecting your respiratory system, your cardiac system, eye movements, swallowing and balance. And if we think back to the first child, he had started um, dragging one leg and his balance had been, set, uh, had been um, affected. They generally will, affect, will um, present with double vision. However, the first child didn't because he actually had already had a squint previously. So that was a little bit different. Um, reduced eye movements. Um, obviously both of them by the time we sent them off MRIs had large restrictions of their lateral rectuses. But when we first picked up the first child, it was a very small restriction um, of that lateral rectus. And it's very easy when you see a child a lot to um, just think that everything will stay the same. They can also get facial weakness and asymmetry. Um, their arms and legs will get weak. They can have problems with their walking and their coordination. Speech can be affected. Uh, their swallowing can be affected. They can start having problems with their breathing and they can start having arrhythmias from their heartbeats. Biopsies can be done, but they're not always necessary but surgery is not an option. Um, it's a very aggressive tumour and because of where it's located, it just isn't an option to go in and do surgery. And there isn't any chemotherapy that helps to um, uh, stop this tumour. Uh, I think it slows it down a little bit, but um, uh, sorry, radiotherapy will help the symptoms um, and the median survival rate for this tumour, once it's been found, is between five to eight months, so not very long at all. Um, the children will be can be given steroids, um, lenoxaprol lenox for the stomachs, uh, radiotherapy. Both of these children have passed away within seven months. So if you see a new onset squint in a school-aged child, um, just need to have a think it's easy to think it's just a normal childhood squint with an common development, but think about other things. Also think if you've got a child who normally controls their squint, but stops controlling it. If they have a head posture, and if there's any other neurological signs, although to begin with in both these children, there weren't. And I'm afraid that's it. I think I spoke too quickly and Hello? I'm coming back on. I'm just sort of, yeah. Um, can you stop sharing your, your screen then, Sarah? Thank you very much. So thank you very much for that. There's, um, I've had a couple of messages saying that there was so much that the optoms had forgotten, the optoms that messaged me. So thank you very much for that. Um, there is, um, um, <laughs> I'm hoping the questions are going to come flooding in. There is a question we've had, and I think you did briefly mention this, but I, it's something I always struggle with. Um, so uh, the question is, what does it mean when you talk about a squint with or without identity? And I always get confused. OK, so with and without identity is for microtropias, so at angles that are less than 10 diopters. And confusingly, with identity means that you will not see anything on a cover test. So they are, are using their eccentric fixation point um, at the same point as their abnormal retinal correspondence. So you, even when you cover over their good eye, because they're using that point, you won't see any point on uh, any movement on uh, cover test. A microtropia without identity, you will see a very slight or a flick movement on um, cover test because they're not quite using the eccentric fixation point at the same point as the um, ARC. Did that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think I've got it in my head now. Um, so um, when a child is referred into you to start patching, mm -hmm. um, can you just let us know how often you would see the child and what sort of, how soon would you expect to see an improvement with patching? Um, so uh, 
general policy at the moment is that once they've been in and given be, been refracted, if they're given glasses, they'll get a telephone follow up at about six to eight weeks um, just to check that they've got the glasses, they're wearing the glasses, everything's going OK. Um, and then we'll see them at 16 weeks. And if the vision is still reduced, we'll start patches then. Um, we tend to see children. Um, it's all changed because of COVID, which is why I'm going oh, um, about every six to eight weeks. Um, but sometimes some of those will be telephone follow ups just to check that they're doing OK with the patches, that they're wearing them, that they aren't having any problems. Um, how quickly we would expect to see a improvement <laughs> is a very difficult question because everybody's different. Um, but I think over a six to eight week period, I would hope to see a line or so improvement each time. Um, and when we send them off with patches, we tend to say about four to six hours of patching. Um, so if they're in school, we'll often say put it on in the morning and they're happy to wear it in school. Um, and I would never make a child wear a patch in school because everybody reacts differently to these things. Um, but if they put it on in the morning, take it off at lunchtime um, and try and do something concentrated with it. Running around in the back garden with your patch on isn't going to make your eyes work very hard. Um, so colouring, drawing, Lego bricks, jigsaw puzzles, um, not something that the parents like me to point out. But computer games have been shown to be very good because they have to concentrate on what they're doing. Um, but yeah, so about every six to eight weeks. With atropin, we see them uh, three weeks after they started the atropin to check if there's any problems. And then after that, we have to see them every six weeks. Brilliant, thank you. Before I'm gonna to apologize to everyone from my background, because as you know, Sarah's my wife and Sarah's got the laptop in the lounge. So I'm in the study. So my- Hi laptop. My, but the background is a bit cluttered, so apologies. But um, the next question, which is uh, go leading on from the first topic, which um, again is sort of, yeah, my, I don't really understand this. And um, how do you detect if uh, a child has a microtropia with identity because you won't see anything on the cover test, which is really good? So you can use a visioscope to actually look at their fixation. But in community, we wouldn't have a visual scope, would we? Probably not. I don't know. Do you have a visual scope in community? Not where I've worked. <laughs> um, so with a visual scope, it um, shines, uh, uh, well, it depends on which one it is, but it shines like a little star onto the back of the fovea. So when you look in, you can see where they're fixing and the fovea is just like a little white pinprick. So if they're looking straight at it and they're looking with their fovea, then the Prevere will be in the middle of the star, whereas if they're using eccentric fixation, then that fixation point will be slightly para -favial. Okay, I think I've got that. <laughs> uh, is it okay to prescribe a plus 0.75 dark sphere to a child complaining of headaches when reading or using computers? Um, I think if you can show it makes a difference and it helps their vision, um, then, yeah, I mean, a child should be able to accommodate over an 075, so that, but equally, if that's all that's coming up, but they're complaining that they can't see clearly, but I would also check their convergence, and I would make sure it's a cycloret to check there isn't any underlying prescription there. But that's probably a better one for the hospital optometrist, Ian. Yeah, I'm trying to think in community first, uh, headaches. If, would I prescribe 075? I'm not sure. Depends on the child and the circumstances, yeah. I think, really. Yeah. Is my answer. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, do you still use Baglini glasses for ARC? I haven't seen those for years. I studied in university. So do you still use them? Yes, Ian, we do. I I'll show you them in a minute. Um, yes, we do. Um, uh, so Baglini glasses will normally show a BSV cross on them. Um, if you've got somebody who is extremely good at describing what they see, they will actually see a very small um, gap in one of the lines um, coming from their microtropic eye because they've got a little bit of suppression there. Okay. Um, but 
I think I've probably had two or three children who've been able to pick that out, but basically they'll just get a BSV cross. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. If we find a child who we think has a Browns or Dwayne's, should we refer in to assess or see again in a small recall to reassess? Um, I think if it's the first time it's been seen, um, and also it depends on the age. So if we're talking about a child who's under the age of seven or eight, then I would say yes, um, because they can end up with problems with the vision in that eye. So especially with Dwayne's and the squints. Um, I think if it's the first time it's ever been seen and the parents say they've, it's never been noticed before, nobody's ever picked it up before, or more commonly, they've never been taken to an optometrist before, um, then, oh, hi, Abby. Um, then <laughs> it's probably a good idea to get them referred in. If everything's nice and stable and the doctors are happy that is all it is, then we can discharge them back. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, given there is no improvement on cover test with a micro squint, how can we be sure if there is or isn't a micro squint? I think this is similar to the question previous, isn't it? You mean because if there's no movement? Yeah, um, no movement on a cover test. Right. The micro squint. So, um, community be sure. So, if they've got a micro squint, then, as I say, the fixation, but I appreciate you guys may not have the equipment to look at that. Um, four diopter test. So, use a four diopter. Um, if it's an ESO micro base out, if it's an exo micro base in, um, and see if they overcome it. Um, if they are, if they have um, eccentric fixation, then you won't see them overcome the prism because they won't get the diplopic image to um, stimulate them to move the eye to overcome it. So but also, if you've got a reduction in vision in that eye and they're not getting full stereopsis, then quite often that is because they've got a micro. So can you can you use it's probably more for optometrists, can you use a fixation target on a specialist ophthalmoscope? What? Yeah, I've never used them, but yeah, you can there is a yeah, fixation target on ophthalmoscope. Not sure on that one. Okay, we can throw that one out. Maybe somebody else can tell us. Yeah, so that was on, on the chat. Um, so um recently I had an increased case of convergence insufficiency potentially due to excessive amounts of screen wear due to lockdown. Yeah. I advised near point conversion exercises to solve this, but the patient and parents requested prisms, which I'm reluctant to do due to reliance on prisms. Would you advise perseverance with exercises or give the prisms temporarily and to do frequent reviews? Um, it depends on the age of the child. Um, I find that convergence exercises in children to about the age of eight, seven or eight are often not very good just purely because they just don't concentrate on them and they're boring, if we're perfectly honest. Um, but I agree, I would be very cautious about giving prisms because they'll just relax into them. Um, so, yeah, I would say persevere with um, exercises, refer into the hospital because we have other exercises other than just um, follow convergence. Um, sometimes, yes, we especially if they're at an age where it's interfering with exams and schoolwork, we might give a little bit of prism purely for certain tasks, but do, sorry, but do the exercises as well. Um, and there have been children where we've had to give prisms in order to be able to give them exercises because they just can't converge enough to even get to sort of 40 centimetres. Um, but I would be very cautious. And if I did give a prism, I would give the absolute minimum I could. Um, and frequent reviews. Very frequent reviews. Um, preferably, I think we'd like them back out of the prism as soon as possible and explain to the parents that, that you know, it, mm. they can rely on them. Um, and it's much more difficult to get people back out of them the more prism they've got. If there is no improvement to convergence insufficiency after six months and no improvement with extra minus lenses, would this need further investigation and what would this involve? 
Um, I'm going to say yes, because if they're not improving, then yes, it needs investigation. Um, convergence insufficiency is a really difficult one because it's one of those things where you really don't know how much effort has been put in with the exercises. Um, but, and again, it depends an awful lot on the age of the person we're talking about. Um, but I would say yes, if you're confident that they've tried all the, but you know, um, I don't know what exercises you give, but I'm guessing it's normally just follow convergence um, and maybe jump convergence. Um, then yes, refer them in. If nothing else, sometimes just a second opinion and somebody telling them the same thing can help. How do you feel about optoms in community patching children? Uh, oh, it worries me in that I, as far as I know, it's very difficult for optoms in community to see children on a very regular basis to <clears throat> um, monitor what's going on. And as I say, a child who's being patched needs to be seen preferably at least every six eight ten weeks um i mean as long as i i mean they've got to, you've got to also got to make sure they've had all the other tests done and there isn't anything else going on um and we have plenty of hospital clinics around here so um i, I i'm an orthoptist so <laughs> yes but i as, as i understand it and it is something that optometrists are allowed to do so but I, I would prefer that they were in the hospital than being seen on a very regular basis but if you know I don't think if I was in community I would want to patch because you have to see but be very confident that um there isn't anything else going on as well um would you consider prescribing base in prism for near exophoria or reduced near point convergence which is symptomatic at near whilst reading or using a VDU? Uh, again, it depends on the age of the person we're talking about, but yeah, it, I mean, if people have got a near exotropia um, and they are symptomatic and getting um, diplopia, then yeah, we will give um, Fresnel prisms. Again, we give it the minimum we possibly can. Um, so, I mean, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, I had a, a patient the other day who was measuring about 25, but actually controlled beautifully with a 10. Um, and what we don't want is for them to be given the full amount of prism, because as we said earlier, they'll just prism adapt to them and we'll just end up increasing them and then gets much more difficult after that. So yeah, if you are giving prisms for to help with um, diplopia, then obviously minimum possible, but depends on who it is. <laughs> Thank you. So. Um... Question from a, a participant. So a symptomatic patient while reading and assumed reduced accommodation, should we consider a reading ad and how we decide the ad power as any plus will help? Um, try, sorry, repeat that one. So um, you've got a symptomatic patient um, while reading and assuming they have a reduced accommodation, should we consider a reading ad? So a symptomatic patient whilst reading, they're struggling with reading. I mean, I guess, again, this is all age related really, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I mean, if they're symptomatic in that they can't see clearly, then yes, they might need a reading ad and, and people need reading ads at different ages. So, um, but if it's a child, then I'd think, probably refer in and check cyclorefraction and everything else first. Thank you. How often would you recommend convergence exercise for and how long in a day? So we tend to say convergence exercises should be done about four or five times a day for preferably about two minutes. Um, I seem to remember one of my optometrists telling me that they were told to put on a short pop song or song and do the convergence exercises till it finished um, and then uh, also importantly make sure that they relax their eyes afterwards so that they don't get any spasms. What can you suggest to improve convergence if a child does not appreciate physiological diplopia? 
Um, yeah. well, I mean, if they're not getting diplopia, then their convergence wouldn't really be an issue. It would, they wouldn't be symptomatic. Um, but yeah, we do get children who don't always notice what's going on with their eyes. And what we tend to do is get the parents to sit opposite them when they're doing the exercises to make sure that they are fixating on the object that's moving towards them. Um, the problem is that this then involves a parent and a child sitting in the same place for a while. Um, and it, it's very difficult to do. Thank you for that. I'd say um, a tough one for your next one. Okay, when you giggle at me, that doesn't make me feel confident. <laughs> so, and, and I'll, I'll tell you who asked this question afterwards so you can uh, message them. What is the legal basis of patching in practice when hospital eye service can provide this service? Are you a lawyer? Do you know the question for that? You yes, mean for right? optometrists to patch? Yeah, what's the legal basis for patching in practice when heads can provide a service? I don't know. That's not me. Um, I was just told by an optometrist that it is within their purview to um, patch if they feel that they can. But as I say, preferably I would prefer them in the hospital. And I don't think we live in a that much of a rural area around here that people can't be referred in. Yeah. And I've just had one of the other comments. Um, hi, and Sarah. I realise this evening is mainly regarding children, but I've tested a few adult patients relatively recently who have had strabismus surgery. What's the rules guidelines surrounding adult surgery currently? Would you know that? Or? Uh, in what, I mean, we, we, so squint surgery has restarted. Um, there is a very long backlog um, for squint surgery, um, but we are doing it. If you've got a patient who wants cosmetic or functional squint surgery, obviously if they're functional, if they're getting symptoms, if they're getting symptoms, um, then they will probably be a little bit more urgent on the list than purely cosmetics. Um, but yes, yeah, so squint surgery has restarted. Okay. If that was the question. Uh, I'm just on the question on the quote on the chat here. So an unexplained low stereopsis result could be used to indicate a micro screen squint. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Good. With EXO, wouldn't negative ad be useful? Negative ad. I don't think you get a bifocal with a negative ad, but would negative spectacles, reading spectacles, be useful with an EXO? So we do over minus EXOs um in order to um simu simulate stimulate their accommodation to help them control it yeah thank you and oh, questions coming in is there a best time of day to perform sorry to perform convergence exercises when you're awake um no i mean we tend to suggest that it's spread out over the day um so maybe breakfast, lunch, tea, bedtime. Um, I think doing, if your convergence is such that it gets worse when you're tired, then I think doing all the exercises first thing in the morning isn't gonna do a lot of good. Um, Cause obviously you need to be exercising when your convergence is down, but no, we tend to say spread it out equally through the day. Yeah. Sorry, I joked about being awake because I did have a parent once who told me that they were patching their child when they were asleep. So you, sometimes you do have to be more obvious with your statements than you think you should be. Is Botox used more commonly when non-accommodative tropia rather than surgery these days? Is Botox uh, used? Not within our trust, no. Can it be used in other trusts then? Oh, you can use Botox, um, but we don't use it that much in our trust. We just, just before COVID started, we had got some equipment and a doctor who was very keen to do it. Um, but then with the lockdown and everything, things have changed. Now, whether other trusts use Botox more than we do isn't something I can comment on. Okay, thank you very much. Well, that's all the questions I've managed to get through. So that's good because normally I don't get through them all. So thank you very much for your effort and time for tonight's word. I know you've put a lot of work into it. And yes, uh, I apologize for three weeks ago. Yes, so yeah, but we're here, we're here now, we've done it. 
Um, so thank you very much for attending tonight. I think you'll all uh, hopefully wish me uh, or with me wish Sarah thank you very much for for this. And um, I have got the next two webinars planned, one for the beginning of June and one for the beginning of July. I will be putting a message on the group this weekend about the next webinar because I'd like your help in topics to include in the next webinar, which one of the consultants has kindly agreed I can do. So, um, so I'll be messaging about that. Thank you very much everyone for watching. I will upload the CET this weekend and I will try and get the, um, the YouTube video with Sarah's help loaded as well um but i think we've 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 done an hour so uh thank you very much i think i've got for everyone's questions i'd like to apologize i think some people at the start had problems with sarah's slides being in the small screen not the big screen um but then a few people messaged me to say that they logged out logged back in and it worked fine so i don't think that says i think that's zoom i'm not sure why it, some people had that experience and i had one comment that the internet was Poor, and I'm hoping that it's not been poor for everyone. We've had a Sarah and I have been in the same house tonight, so we're using the same internet, but we've got quite good internet supply, and we tested it a few weeks ago, and we've watched different things at the same time, and it seemed to work fine. So if anyone's had any problems with the internet speed, I hope that wasn't us, but apologies uh, for that. Uh, but next time, it will be a consultant in their house on their internet, and it'll be me here. So it won't be two people using devices on one internet. So hopefully the uh, connection will be a little bit better. But thank you very much again for watching. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll let you know when the CT is uploaded and when the next webinar is going to be. But until then, stay safe. Thank you very much for watching and being a part of uh, ESEG. And I think I've just had one more question. Woo, go Sarah from Pippa. That's not a question, that's a statement, is it? It's over the chat. So but thank you very much. But thank you very much, everybody. Nice to uh, have you with us again. And um, I'll say goodbye for now. Bye-bye. Bye, Sarah. I'll see you bye. in a minute. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.